Just one reading this morning, and it comes from James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will face stricter judgment. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is mature, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a, a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of life, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse people made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes a blessing and a curse. My brothers and sisters, this ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. So much like many other people, and not just Americans, I spent much of Wednesday remembering 9-11, um, you know, doing the usual thing, reminding myself of the way the day's events um, happened, how they affected me. For me, the aftermath was the worst, for reasons that I'll share. But uh, the, the TV I watched the towers fall on was only about 15 inches at the time. That was before we had all the flat screens and high definition and, and all that. But then some years later, watching the event again on a 51-inch screen with color correction and re-rendering and high definition, uh, that was not an experience that I enjoyed. Uh, in fact, it was gut-wrenching. It only drove home how traumatic that event was for me, and I can only imagine for countless other people. And I also considered how 23 years later, we're a very different country than we were back then. In addition to 9-11, two other major events in our history, recent history, have effectively changed everything about the way that we interact with each other. And that would be social media and COVID. Now, Wednesday was, for me, a fresh reminder of our utter failure as a society to learn from our mistakes, our failure to learn the value of unity. Despite the tools that we have been given to become more connected than we have ever been, if anything, we're more disconnected and divided. Religious radicals with a warped perspective of faith, a faith that most Americans barely understand even to this day, unified us in a very vivid way all those years ago. In a unified fashion, Americans and their allies united in a declaration of faith, different kind of faith, of their own, and our message was that terrorism was an abomination to us. It was a visceral reaction 
to that terrible occasion. We declared it to be an abomination. It had no place in our world. And yet our lack of understanding also led to a horrific side effect, which on its face was called Islamophobia, but under the surface, at a more basic level, was a complete questioning of who we might consider to be on our side. And depending on who you are and where you come from, our side could mean almost anything. And if a person wasn't on our side, and we didn't understand or, or like their perspective, if there was something about them that kind of rubbed us the wrong way, more and more we began to dehumanize those people, have nothing to do with them. All of this stemmed from an increasing lack of trust in our society. And that's been true for some time, but it seems that with each year that goes by, we lose more trust. Trust in each other, trust in governance, any authority figures, really. So many innocent Muslims were sort of lumped into the same group, despite very visible contributions to our common life as Americans. And when you think about it, these folks have endured so much scrutiny over the last 23 years because instead of attributing the evil intentions of terrorists who carried out the attacks, centering our focus on a perspective appropriately named radical, radical, Many of us chose to blame an entire religion instead. Of course, that's nothing new for us as Christians. The same has been said of Christianity over the years. So many Christians, in fact, elected to ignore their scriptures, to participate in a radical religious hatred of their own, again, with a warped perspective of a faith one might say they barely understood and perhaps never truly sought to. I mean, God help you if you ever approached anyone like that with such a critical idea. Not exactly welcome. And Christianity, like Islam, asks a lot of its believers. It makes certain demands that seem unreasonable to modern sensibilities. Now, these folks flouted the ideals, these radicals, they flouted the ideals that the author of James advocated for, especially verses 8 and 9 of today's reading, which says, But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. On the evening of 9-11, a singular event took place on the steps of the Capitol, and it was a momentary oddity for such a contentious setting. Anyone here ever been to the Capitol? Anyone here ever been in a session before? Yeah. So you know, the joining together of politicians with very real, very deep divisions came together to grieve what had happened and they stood in solidarity. They found something that united them, even for a moment, and united us as well. Something that mattered more than what divided them. After issuing a joint declaration condemning the attacks, the politicians broke out in singing, God bless America. To this day, that event serves as a powerful statement of unity. I remember watching CNN at the time and watching it happen, and it was so organic. It seemed to me that it, there was no way it had been planned because it was just so organic. And I go back on YouTube every year when we commemorate 9-11 to watch it. It's still there. And every year that goes by, when I watch that clip, <clears throat> it makes me sadder 
But its promise of hope keeps sort of pulling me back to it. Like I can hold on just for a second to that feeling, that feeling of unity. It also reminds me that our young people, some who were not even born at the time of that event, have never been taught the value of political unity despite division. Our society almost seems to reward standing in opposition to something, to a perspective dissimilar to our own. You know, we're always told, hey, stand up for what you believe in. Not, we are all in this together. Whenever I think about 9-11, my mind inevitably goes back to 2003. And this is what I was alluding to when I said that the aftermath was a bit worse for me and my family than the event, which was traumatic in its own right. And 2003 was when we invaded Iraq to depose Saddam Hussein in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Now, just as COVID changed our world just four years ago, the war on terror changed America forever. Not just about the ways that we interact with airports, but every level of our lives as security became a concern to address. In 2017, the same president that initiated the war on terror called on Americans to confront domestic terrorists who perpetuated violence in Charlottesville, North Carolina. It's as if the war had simply moved from one part of our world to our part of the world. I'll never forget that day in February 2003, when my brother told us that he was going to Iraq. Lance Corporal Esteban Dominguez was called up to service alongside the 1st Marine Division. He was going to ship out to Kuwait to participate in the buildup to the invasion that would take place the following month. Now, Esteban was at Camp Pendleton in Oceanside, California, after word got out for his unit to return to base. He called me and he told me he was going to be coming home with his gear and asked that I should clear space in the living room, lots and lots of space. My brother and I, my other brother Daniel, we kind of shoved everything up against the walls and we waited for him to arrive. I went to my mom's bedroom, she was bedridden back then, and I remembered helping her into her wheelchair and wheeling her into the living room and together we just sort of sat for about a half an hour and we didn't say anything. Esteban arrived in the evening with his car packed full to the brim with equipment, clothing, bags, and we brought in armfuls one at a time and we laid everything out according to his instructions. He showed us where every item should go, you know, how to load various pieces, how to compact stacks to make as much room as possible, what bags were meant for what things. Mom was quietly crying in the corner of the room, and every so often Esteban would stop what he was doing, he would get up, and periodically he'd go over and he'd kiss her on the cheek. And it was well into the night before we were done, it took hours. He was going to deploy the following morning, so we talked, we prayed throughout the night, we said our goodbyes, and it's a hard thing, you know, watching your mom come to the realization that she might never see her child come home again. I gave Esteban an arrowhead pendant I used to wear for good luck, and I poured fervent prayers of protection into it. The following morning, we helped him load his car and we watched him drive away before the dawn. Eight months later, he came back, but he was a changed man. He returned the pendant and it was changed too. The decorative stone in its center, a bright blue stone shining, had been scratched into oblivion dulled from repeated exposure to intense heat and desert sand. 
In the months that followed, Esteban shared stories with me of his experiences that I will never share with anyone, things that anger me to this day. Not angry at him, angry at the system of governance that had sent him to serve, that could find no better solution to our common problem in those days than to sacrifice so many young people's futures. I could never understand why our combat veterans ever had to worry about how they would house, feed, or care for themselves for the rest of their lives, why those things weren't just handed to them on a silver platter. I can assure you that in my brother's case, they were not. He had to fight for everything that was owed him. Like so many Americans, Esteban felt a swell of patriotism in the aftermath of 9-11. It moved him to enlist. I felt the same swell. He was never clear on his motivations. He just said, it's important. I feel like it's important. And even after he was released from active duty, he continued to serve. He felt personally responsible for his fellow Marines, particularly those he had served with who were joining other missions. That feeling of personal responsibility for his brothers and sisters in arms is what I think the author of James was getting at. The author simply doesn't see how someone who calls themselves a Christian does not experience unity born out of self-control. These days, we think of unity as something that happens after the fact. In response to something that may offend our sensibilities, not as a foundation for who we are as Americans. The author of James teaches us that self-control isn't something that we observe after losing control. It's something that you learn to do over time. With age comes wisdom. You come to confess that you're prone to sin. And so you seek to exercise control over this predisposition so that when you find yourself in a situation where you know that you're gonna lose control of your tongue, you are ready. You've done your homework. You've made your preparations. That's personal responsibility. It is something that you settle for yourself. My brother acknowledged that he had a responsibility to his Marine brethren. No one needed to tell him that. It was a perspective forged in the fire of combat. And we too have an opportunity to be forged in much the same way. The fire of a global pandemic consumed many innocent lives. We faced an enemy that cared nothing about the ideals we claim or how closely we hold them in the face of opposition. In times like those, it is so easy, so easy to silo ourselves, to stop caring about strangers and focus on our differences or the fears that we have, to justify our lack of responsibility when it comes to our fellow Americans. Now, we might not all have the benefit of military training or unit cohesion to bring us together, we have to make that decision for ourselves. And yet after vaccines and additional treatments made their mark on the pandemic, shifting us to an endemic perspective of the disease, our society changed once again, forever. And so too our sensitivity to other diseases and the symptoms of those all around us, causing us to center on our own personal discomfort as we hear coughs and sneezes instead of considering the health of our fellow Americans. The politicization of healthcare has robbed so many of us of our livelihoods 
as we attempt to navigate a broken system that puts profits before people regardless of who you vote for. We still haven't fixed it. At some point, for things to get better, for us to experience true unity, we must ask ourselves if the way we feel about the things we despise about other people is worth more to us than fixing the problems that plague our days. As people of faith navigating religious divisions in the modern world, we need to ask ourselves if our disagreements are worth the sacrifice we make of our unity in faith. We just finished a sermon series on Methodism and the power that it has to bring people together in common mission. But siblings in Christ, that mission has been sacrificed more than 200 times in our history as a faith tradition over various issues that at the time seemed very important but steered us away from our common mission. Now, I don't know about you, but I have seen enough disunity and its effects. I don't care about being right anymore. What does it matter how right I am if I sacrifice all these people around me to accomplish my own ends. If I sacrifice the relationships I might have with them, each one of them made beautiful by my Lord in their own right, I am ready, beyond ready, to try a new way, even if it costs me that ridiculous swell of serotonin that drives me forward at the expense of other people. I am ready to tame my tongue and these fingers that so readily lay blame on other people online instead of asking myself what part I'm playing in our world's ills. I don't want to wait until the next tragedy to find my better angels. I am tired. I'm tired of seeing people in despair and hopelessness. I want to do something about it. I want to give them reason to believe that something different is possible. I'm not perfect. I do lose control from time to time. We all do. But I have experienced the consequences of when that happens for me. I don't want that for anyone. I want God to speak through me to order my steps. I want to see what we can do to bring good and unity into this world so that people might have cause to hope. You might uh, give the following exercise a try this week. Ask somebody, hey, what are we going to do about all these problems in our world? Kind of a big question. See what kind of response you get. Chances are you're going to face a lot of negativity. It's not a question we like talking about, especially in pleasant conversation. But I dare say that in doing so, you have enabled that person to start thinking strategically about the subject. You've also shown them that you care about what they think and frankly, I think God gives brownie points to those willing to ask that question of someone with starkly different beliefs from your own. If you take your courage in hand and give it a shot, that might be all it takes to create unity between you. 
And so my prayer for you this week, church, is that God would give you the courage to practice self-responsibility and self-control to grant you the awareness of self that you need to put those made in God's image first before your opinions of them as James the Just, brother of Jesus the Lord and first bishop of the Church of Jerusalem asks of us.